A category of lost media that I don't see get brought up as often nowadays is fake or hoaxed lost media. This doesn't necessarily mean pieces of lost media that are intentionally made up to troll people, or people who make false claims about having a piece of lost media, but rather content that people believed existed when in fact it actually doesn't. I've kind of talked about that a bit before on my channel with topics like Kablam episode 29 and the Ah Real Monsters movie, which people believe existed, but was just a misremembering or combination of false memories. While I love talking about those topics, these examples are on a smaller scale in themselves, and overall, I didn't spend a whole lot of time searching for them. But that doesn't mean all fake lost media is easy to debunk. There have been a few topics in the past that I spent hours and hours looking into, sometimes months, that became obsessions only to reach the disappointing conclusion that they actually don't exist and weren't real as we believed they were for a variety of different reasons. Despite this fact, some of these searches have become really iconic and nostalgic for me. So today, I'd like to talk about fake lost media that I spent time searching for. The first topic that we're going to discuss is really iconic in its own way. And even if you're not in the lost media loop, I'm sure you've probably come across it at one point or another. This particular piece of fake lost media is even older than the lost media wiki itself and was talked about back in the mid 2000s on different Spongebob fan sites and forums. This is the infamous Squidward transforming scene, otherwise known as Snail Word, that came from one of the earliest episodes of Spongebob from season 1. This episode is about Squidward having to take care of Gary when Spongebob leaves town. And of course, Squidward neglects Gary, so by the end of the episode, he needs to be injected with snail plasma to make him feel better. When they're doing this in one of the final scenes, Squidward misses and accidentally hits Spongebob with the snail plasma, and as a result, this transforms Spongebob into a snail. Now, later on in the episode, snail Spongebob chases around Squidward in a little bit of a chaotic scene towards the end. And what happens is Squidward finds himself getting injected with the snail plasma, and as a result, transforms into a snail himself. At the end of the episode, you can see all three snails on the fence, which is where things end. However, the real mystery of this episode came right after Squidward got injected with the snail plasma. There's a wipe transition, and that wipe transition is one of the most infamous wipe transitions of all time because it created years of speculation and rumor and theory about a possible deleted scene that was taken out of all future airings of this episode except for the original. There were some people that believed, yes, this wipe transition was added to the episode in later airings after the scene of Squidward transforming was cut, while there were other people that claimed, the wipe transition adds to the comedic effect of Squidward transforming how you don't actually see it and that such a scene doesn't exist. Reasons for the scene being cut were claimed to be from the fact that it was deemed too scary for kids. However, there was really no evidence to support this aside from the fact that people just claimed they had seen it in the original airing of the episode back in October of 1999. And things stayed this way for quite a while, the rumor really lived on because no one could prove or disprove whether or not this scene actually existed, it was completely up for speculation. I was pretty convinced at the time that no amount of false memories or misinformation could really lead me to believe this was fake because if so many people remembered it being real, how could it possibly be fake? How could you misremember a scene of Squidward transforming? In fact, I remember one of the most common theories I came across was the fact that in Season 1 Spongebob episodes, a frequent transition that was used in the episodes were the bubble effects, and it was speculated that because this scene used a wipe transition, that was proof that it was edited after it originally aired. What's more is some people claimed that this episode aired uncensored overseas, specifically in Poland, and that if you could track down a Poland recording of the episode, the scene would be intact and you'd be able to see it. But of course, back in 2016, you couldn't find the Polish airing of this episode, so that in itself kind of spawned its own little search. Until eventually, we did finally get proof that it was fake. Towards the end of all of this debate and discussion, 
Someone did have a recording of the original airing of this episode back when it premiered, and that was proven by some of the bumpers that were on the tape, as well as the little Nickelodeon icon that was used at the bottom of the screen. This was the original airing. And there is no scene present in this version of the episode. I believe later on, Vincent Waller, who was the showrunner for Spongebob, did confirm that the scene was never even present in the storyboards of the episode, which further proves that the whole idea of it existing was just a false memory. But I think if I had come across this topic nowadays, I probably would have believed it was fake from the beginning. I think back then we just didn't see a whole lot of like fake lost media and false memories like we do nowadays, so I kind of was more inclined to believe it was real. But nowadays, if I came across something like this that had really no proof outside of memories, yeah, I'd probably believe it was fake before I believed it was real. One of the questions I always get asked by my viewers is what my favorite pieces of lost media are. And in those discussions, I always tell them Three Men is on the top of the list. Now, if you haven't been watching my videos for a long time, you might not have heard about Three Men because it's not a very popular topic and it doesn't get brought up very often. However, it was one of the most memorable pieces of lost media I ever tried to find, even though it's not actually real. This was a topic that I found on the Lost Media Wiki forums a long time ago, and it piqued my interest ever since I first read it. Essentially, the thread went on to talk about a long-lost pilot to Ed, Ed, and Eddie, which was called Three Men and originally pitched to Comedy Central. This pilot was claimed to focus on an earlier version of the Eds, being in their 20s rather than kids in school, and it was said to have a more adult or raunchy feel to it. The story goes that the pitch was rejected, Cartoon Network picked the show up, and it was reworked into the kids show we know today. But apparently this pilot had been lost, barely documented, and was only rumored to exist. Now, Lost Pilots are one of my favorite pieces of Lost Media to research, and once I came across this thread, I had to sink my teeth into it. But I didn't really know what I was getting into. I started this search with a different approach than I do most other Lost Pilot searches, and that was avoiding contacting the creator or anyone associated with the show, and going for the fandom instead. I had this strategy because most creators don't have the pilots anyway to their cartoons, and most of these rumors came from the old fandom, so I thought that looking through old websites and forums would probably point me in a better direction, rather than just asking the creators. What I found most interesting about this search is that, unlike most other searches where old fandoms are non-existent or really hard to find, there was actually quite a bit of documentation for old Ed and Eddie fan sites. I was able to find so many of them, and I browsed all kinds of pages and articles and write-ups and fanfictions of stuff that just kind of got buried online over the past decade or two, and it was really interesting just uncovering how deep the fandom was for this show. A lot of the websites had episode guides and different forms that could be accessed, but I didn't really find anything related to three men right off the bat. It felt like this rumor was more deeply rooted in the fandom rather than just surface level fan sites. So I went out of my way to try and look through forums, find old users, and really get a feel for if this was even mentioned at all back in the day, or where the rumor could have come from. The first of which was a really old forum that looks like it used to be really popular back in the day. There were all kinds of discussions about Ed and Eddie episodes and characters, but most importantly, rumors and unproduced episodes. I thought if there was ever a place for three men to be talked about on old forums, it would probably be in one of these threads. However, Wayback Machine didn't do a great job of archiving too many pages, but I looked through the first two and didn't find any mention of it. That's kinda how a lot of these forums went, is that they weren't archived very well, and the first couple pages just didn't seem to have a lot of information, and I couldn't browse around too much without hitting a dead end. I felt like this wasn't a very good indication of the episode being real, or that people had talked about it back in the day. But I kept looking, and eventually found out that some of these forums kind of branched off over the years into a Discord server, which was surprisingly still active. Again, it kind of goes along the lines of being surprised that so much of the old Ed and Eddie fandom is still around today. I joined the Discord server, which had a lot of active users, and I was thinking this would be the best place to try and get in contact with people to see if they remember the Three Men rumor, and any details about it. So I talked to a few of the people in the server, and they actually didn't remember the rumor at all. 
This actually surprised me quite a bit because if this was real, you'd think that some of these older fans would have remembered it, but it seems like not a whole lot of them did, or not at least to the extent I was looking for. One of the last places I ended up was another forum, but this one was a lot more active and polished than the other ones I had found on the Wayback Machine. I ended up making an account and posting a thread, which received quite a few replies and got a lot of discussion. However, it kind of all ended the same. No one had really heard about it or had any details to provide about it. But there was one last place they suggested I look to get total confirmation about whether or not this was real. One of the oldest community members named Animate Ed was sort of an oracle of the community, so I figured if there was ever someone who would know for sure if this rumor is real or not, it would probably be him. I found him on Twitter and had a conversation with him, and he was a really cool guy, essentially saying that there were a lot of old Ed and Eddie episode rumors that were kind of passed around back in the day, and that he had never heard about the Three Men pilot specifically, but assumed it was probably some kind of fake episode or fan creation that had just been passed around back in the day, and for some reason ended up being taken as fact. He said this kind of thing happened a lot around the time the series was ending in 2009, as people tried to get more content for the show to keep it alive. But this in itself was nothing new, because fake episodes had been passed around the community before. That was pretty much all the confirmation I needed, and after having talked to so many people from the old fandom, I was completely convinced that this just didn't exist at all. And I believe long after I made my video, some people asked the creator of the series on Twitter, and he confirmed that there was no pilot for the show, it was pretty much picked up right away. It's a little bit of a disappointing end, especially when I consider how much time I spent searching for this, it was I think around 18 hours, only to come up empty handed, but it was really fun going back through the fandom, and hearing from the fans that this pilot just didn't exist. It wouldn't be a fake lost media video without some video game topics, and this one in particular surprised me for how long it had gone undocumented and unresearched, which sometimes make for the most interesting mysteries. It's interesting how something can just exist online as fact for so many years until a few people question its validity, which is exactly the case for a piece of video game lost media that I came across a couple years ago, and had never even heard about until stumbling upon it. This was Super Kid Icarus, which was apparently a rumored sequel to the original on NES, but this time it would be on Super NES. I knew that the Kid Icarus franchise was pretty lacking when it came to entries in the series, but I never really thought about if any cancelled games existed, until I found Super Kid Icarus and thought it seemed legit, even though it was strange I had never heard about this title before. Apparently in some old video game magazines, there were write-ups and constant mentions that a Super Kid Icarus was in development for the Super Nintendo, and would be releasing at some point in the mid-90s. Obviously, this never came out, and we never heard anything from the game again, which left me to wonder, what happened to the game and was there a way we could get any content from it? Now this search was pretty different than most other lost media searches I look into, for the fact that it mostly seemed to exist only as text in video game magazines. This wasn't something that was widely discussed or widely posted about, it was kind of limited to a certain number of sources. This wouldn't be the first time that I questioned video game magazines as being legit, since there was an older mystery that I covered several years ago about the Purple Yoshi tech demo from IGN's website, which we kind of believe at this point was just a mock-up used to pull people into their forums, and wasn't actually a screenshot from a lost prototype game. Thankfully with a little looking around, I was able to find some discussion of Super Kid Icarus and other upcoming games that were allegedly cancelled from a few different forums online. What I found most interesting about these posts is that they would constantly reference magazines further and further back in time, as if Super Kid Icarus was a game of telephone, and what was even more interesting about this is the further and further back you went, the more factual the information seemed, with one magazine even going as far to say that Super Kid Icarus would be released in 1995. It's kinda hard to believe that these magazines would post this kind of content without having any screenshots or information from the game at all, and this leads us back to what I believe was the original source of the game an Italian magazine that wrote an article about the game all the way back in 1994. This article in particular really seemed to hype up the game, and first made many of the claims that were echoed by future magazines in the coming years. But the question remained that, 
for all these magazines that claimed the game was existing and had details about the game, and even a rumored release date, why did we never see any pictures, and why did Nintendo never make a comment about the game? My answer to this question, surprisingly, didn't come from the game magazines themselves, but came from more forums I found while doing research. Apparently during the discussion of Super Kid Icarus and some other cancelled Nintendo games from back in the day, it was stated that magazines such as Electronic Gaming Monthly that made claims about some of these games that never came out often got their information from sources that were not credible or just straight up made information to fill in the pages before a deadline. This practice was really common back in the day and I simply had no idea that it existed. Because of that, it's believed that all the articles that discuss the game from later on in the game's life actually got their information from other magazines or other people in gaming publications, which means that it's all not credible. In fact, that original Italian magazine that reported on the game is believed to be where the rumor originated from and where the magazines that later would post about the game also got their information from. And as for the Italian magazine, well, it seems like their article was just a bunch of hype and rumor, with no actual source behind it, which falls in line with what we know about how more popular gaming magazines would just make up content. Essentially, the whole game is just one big hoax that came from a rumor that no one checked back in the day, and no one really researched in the modern day to tell whether or not it was real. I've been waiting for someone to come forward with any piece of evidence that Super Kid Icarus did in fact exist, and if they did, I would be more than happy, because I really wanted to see a 16-bit Kid Icarus game. But based on all my research and the scarce amount of information that exists for the game, and what we discovered about gaming publications, it just doesn't seem like the game exists in any real form, and it's unfortunate that a game like that existed in such a fake way for so many years. And I'm sure there are lots of other less popular examples of that as well. It's just that no one's either come across them again, or no one's researched them. In a way, I think it's a little funny that so many of my most memorable lost media searches ended up looking for things that didn't actually exist. Like Kablam Episode 29, Three Men, and this topic, which actually got pretty popular back when my first video released, and was how a lot of you guys actually found the channel. This was a topic that I had no idea existed until my friend Jax Cheese showed me an article from a gaming magazine he had that mentioned a peripheral that no one had seen before. Back then, it wasn't often that I found a lot of mysteries surrounding things that physically existed that no one could find. This one in particular was the Super Game Boy 2, which was an add-on to the Super Nintendo and allowed you to play Game Boy games on the big screen. However, the Super Game Boy 2, blue in color, only released in Japan. Or did it? The mystery begins with a rumor that the Super Game Boy 2 also got a very limited US release and copies of that exist out in the wild. However, no one has seen it, no one has documented it, and as far as we know, no one has one. With something as elusive and rare as an American Super Game Boy 2, you have to wonder if anyone out there actually does have one, and my goal of the search was to try and find someone with that peripheral in their collection, or at least evidence that it did exist. Not to mention, there were a lot of really weird rumors about how it released or how one was to obtain it back in the day, with one of the most popular claims claiming that it was exclusively sold on QVC back in the late 90s. But there were also rumors about it getting limited retail releases, and constant mentions of it in guides and different write-ups for the Super Nintendo from back in the day. At first I was thinking that if it was sold on QVC, it probably couldn't be too hard to find, because QVC is pretty well known, and there's a lot of documentation of the website that you can actually find on the Wayback Machine. So between that, some old YouTube recordings, and even some people who used to work there, I'd made my way through the QVC route and tried to see if I could find any evidence that it was actually sold through the channel. Despite my best attempts, the furthest I got with this lead was finding old pages for video game products on QVC's old website, for both the Super Nintendo and Game Boy itself. But I never found anything that involved the Super Game Boy 2, and recordings of products from TV were few and far between from this era. So I tried to get away from the QVC side of things and really look into the gaming community and some of the claims I would see on old websites and old guides 
that stated it existed. One of the more interesting comments I found about it was actually that the US version was not blue in color like the Japanese version, but that it did receive a gray shell, similar to the original Super Game Boy. This is a very specific detail, and something that I figured gaming enthusiasts back in the day probably wouldn't confuse the Super Game Boy 1 for the Super Game Boy 2. Originally, I did end up finding someone who claimed the Super Game Boy 2 did release in the US, and we talked a little bit about it, with them even having claimed they had vivid memories of seeing it on QVC, and that others could back up that claim. Though the problem with this is once I asked for who these other sources were that backed up the claims, the only response I got is that they had vanished or could no longer be reached, which kind of made our whole conversation feel a little invalid because I had no way of verifying what they were telling me except for their memories. But there was one person I wanted to find more than anyone else, and it was someone who had constantly stated back in the day on those old FAQ guides and documentations of Super Nintendo peripherals that the Super Game Boy 2 did get a US release. But the problem with that guy is that I just couldn't find him anywhere. I spent weeks trying to find him, looking through his old FAQs, seeing if I could get any email addresses from there, or if he was just active on any websites nowadays. But it seemed like he was mostly active back in the day, and he just wasn't around in the same gaming communities anymore. But I was so determined I did eventually find him on eBay of all places. While he's not really in the gaming community anymore, he does sell gaming related items on eBay, and I figured this must be the same guy because the username was identical. So I did send him a message and he did reply, yes, he was the same guy from back in the day that claimed the Super Game Boy 2 did get a US release. But strangely, when I asked him about it in our messages, he seemed to deny the existence of a US release and claimed they only came out in Japan. This was kind of confusing, but I was still able to reach a conclusion with what he said. One of the biggest people who said it existed back in the day is now saying it doesn't exist, and the other guy that I talked to that claimed he saw it on QVC doesn't have any sources to back that up, and I can't find any other mention of it online aside from these old fan sites with equally no evidence to back up that it released, which made me believe that the whole thing was some kind of false memory or misinterpretation. And while I still think back in the day on all those FAQs, there was some kind of misinterpretation or details that weren't exactly correct, there actually is a little bit of an update I can report on for this mystery. While the US version of the Super Game Boy 2 doesn't exist in its purest form, as in there was no real localized version of the peripheral released here, What's interesting is that the QVC rumors and the guy that claimed he did see it on QVC might not have been remembering incorrectly after all. I can't even remember how long ago I first came across this information, but I did hear a theory that kind of puts all the pieces together and solves this mystery once and for all. It's now currently believed that QVC did sell Super Game Boy 2s to the US market, however, they were modified Japanese versions. The Super Nintendo is not region locked, which means you can play Japanese games on the console, and one of the ways you can do that is by swapping the cartridge shells of a Japanese game with a US game. This way, you can get a Japanese board in a US cartridge, put it into your Super Nintendo, and it'll work fine. So it's believed that what QVC did was buy a bunch of Japanese blue Super Game Boy 2s, swap the shells to gray, which allowed the components of the Super Game Boy 2 to be used in American Super Nintendos, but rather than have the blue shell, it's the gray shell, which is probably what led to some of the confusion between whether or not it actually got a US release. And by this definition, it didn't really get an official US release, this would kind of be like a modified unofficial version, but it was available in the States, which kind of goes along with the rumor, and is a much more satisfying conclusion than just assuming everyone is misremembering and all the memories are false. Though I will say, we've never found any QVC listings or evidence that this particular product was sold through there, so that remains to be seen. But I do believe that this theory is very plausible and makes a lot of sense when we think about all the information we've gathered so far. I'm also sure they were sold in very limited quantities, so it's almost not even that surprising that we haven't found one by now. But definitely be on the lookout for a Super Game Boy 2 in a gray shell, because that could be one from QVC that would conclude the mystery. 
Even though the US Super Game Boy 2 isn't what we thought it was, and even though so many of these other topics did end up being fake, I still think their stories are worth telling, and it's part of the Lost Media community that we research these topics, even if they end up not being real. Though nowadays, it's a lot less common to go on searches for fake lost media, and in more cases than not, people either dismiss it, or there'll be evidence present to end the mystery before it really gets going. In that way, I think these topics are particularly nostalgic, and I really had a good time searching for them. Hey guys, I hope you enjoyed the video. Be sure to check out some of my other game-related lost media videos. Thanks for watching, and until next time, Finn.